Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. It's that time of year when I seem to have a cold constantly, so I thought for this week's video I'd just get nice and comfy and just read some spooky stories from my collection of ghost story books. The video is titled Spooky Stories to Fall Asleep To, but you don't have to be falling asleep, you can just enjoy them as they are. But if you are watching this to fall asleep to, then uh, get comfy, relax, and uh, I'm going to start off with the book Ghosts of the North by Melanie Warren and Tony Wells. The story is called The Poltergeist of Lucas Road. From outside, the haunted house at Lucas Road seemed quite ordinary. Lucas Road is in an unremarkable town in the county of Durham. The street had its share of problems, not enough work for some of the folk, and maybe a little too much rowdiness on a Friday night. Nothing unusual in an area where the hard pattern of working life centred on the local pit. Traditional work that had absorbed generations of men in the area, and which is now, of course, a past memory. But the occupants of the house in question have a very unusual story to tell. Paul and Mary Clayton had moved into the house in 1965. They were a young couple, not long married, with a baby son, Brian, named after Mary's grandfather. Their lives were full of organising their home and caring for the baby, but by the time Brian was two, Mary was hankering to go back to work. She missed the company of her friends at the biscuit factory, and the extra money would pay for a new kitchen and all the other things that she was keen to do with the house. Mary's parents were quite happy to look after Brian during the day, and this was very convenient as their house was only a few streets away. Mary saved her earnings carefully, and soon they were able to begin work on the new kitchen. The builders took a week to demolish the wall between the tiny back room and the small kitchen, so making a larger, more comfortable room. It was a terribly messy job, but in a couple more weeks the new cabinets would have been fitted and the new floor laid. They were resigned to the mess, and Mary was looking forward to cooking the Christmas dinner for a whole family when it was finished. One winter's evening, just after the kitchen cabinets had been installed, Paul's factory had a problem with the machinery and so they let the workforce home a few hours early. Paul called straight round to Mary's parents to pick up Brian, but nobody was in. He guessed that all three were at the local park, so he went back home, looking forward to a quiet hour or two with a brew in front of the television. As soon as he opened the front door, Paul knew something was wrong, but he couldn't place exactly what it was. There was just a funny feeling in the house. As he closed the front door behind him, he also noticed a funny smell, like burnt cabbage. But that meant Mary must have rushed home at lunchtime, put some cabbage on to cook, then gone back to work and forgotten all about it. That didn't make any sense at all. He went straight into the kitchen to find the source of the smell, expecting to find a blackened pan on the stove, but he certainly didn't expect the sight that confronted him. All the cupboards had been emptied onto the kitchen floor. The place was awash with broken glass, cornflakes, milk, flour and dented cans. It was a terrible sight. Paul's first thought was that the house had been burgled. Knowing what Mary's reaction might be, he ran through the house to appraise himself of any other wreckage and see what might have been taken. After a frenzied examination, he began to relax a little. There was no obvious signs of damage, and nothing actually appeared to have been stolen. He examined the back door and any other places of entry, and he couldn't see any way a burglar could have got into the house without forcing a way in. All was secure. So how did the kitchen come to be wrecked? Paul called the police, and when the constable arrived, he was just as puzzled. He confirmed that there was no forced point of entry, and he couldn't understand why nothing had been taken. As Paul had expected, he also wasn't very encouraged about the possibility of catching the culprits, but he was sympathetic, and he offered to stay until Mary got home to help break the bad news. There was no doubt in Mary's mind when she returned that evening that they'd had burglars and she was very upset. Then she became quite frightened about the whole affair and for several weeks talked of moving out of the house entirely. That foul smell persisted despite everything she did. She was sure it was a spiteful prank by the intruders to have hidden some rotting garbage somewhere it couldn't be found. But the family's ordeal wasn't over yet. 
ten days later, Paul got an urgent phone call at work from his neighbour June. It seemed that there was the sound of banging and crashing and the shattering of glass coming from the house. Paul, hopeful that he might catch the burglars red-handed, asked her to phone the police whilst he asked his foreman for a few hours off. He drove furiously across town to his house and, to his relief, found a policeman outside. It was the same one who called round the last time and so there was no need for explanations. As they stood outside, they could both hear the noises of doors banging and glass crashing. Without a word, Paul opened the door with his key and let the constable in first. Paul followed him into the hallway and up the stairs as the sounds were coming from the top of the house. He was so intent on getting the perpetrators who were invading his house that it wasn't until nearing the top landing that he again noticed the intense burnt vegetable smell. This time the smell was so bad that he nearly vomited. He fought the sensation and rushed onto the landing and suddenly the noise stopped. Once on the top landing, Paul found the policeman looking puzzled with his head to one side standing in the bedroom doorway. Not sure what was going on, Paul pushed past him to confront the now quiet burglars and found nothing. He did a double take and checked the other two rooms. Nothing was out of place. There was no obvious reason for the noises that they'd all heard. As can be imagined, Mary was almost beside herself. The effect that this peculiar incident had on the household was to impose further strain. Mary was now threatening to take Brian and move temporarily back to her parents' house. Paul, as well as having to support Mary, was finding it difficult to sleep, for he was constantly mentally replaying the events, trying to find an explanation for the sounds that they'd all heard, which seemed to have no physical cause. Three days later the next incident occurred, and again with witnesses. It was a Saturday morning and Paul had his workmate Alan round to help him with a plumbing problem in the kitchen. Mary had taken Brian to her parents whilst the water was disconnected. This problem had been caused by Paul in the first place as a direct result of the awful smells. In an attempt to find the cause, Paul had checked the kitchen sink waste pipe. He found it remarkably easy to dismantle, but when reassembled, it leaked. Alan was under the sink with a wrench, tightening up the joints, with Paul outside in the garden holding a section of pipe still. Suddenly there was a loud pop and then a curse as Alan bumped his head under the kitchen cupboard. Paul rushed into the kitchen to find Alan upright, rubbing his head and looking at the kitchen work surface which was now covered in brown sauce. The cause of the pop was plain to see. The bottle had exploded. The pressure inside it had actually caused the bottle top to embed itself in the polystyrene ceiling. Paul stared at the bottle and the mess in the kitchen and then jumped as one of the kitchen cupboard doors swung open gently and a packet of Rice Krispies tipped over, spilling its contents over the floor. They both looked at each other and then Paul bolted out of the back door with Alan following close behind. Alan refused to set foot in the house ever again and it was at about this time that friends and family started to use the word poltergeist in connection with the incidents which were beginning to get more and more destructive. The crunch came about a month later when Paul, Mary and Brian had a particularly bad night. For several hours it sounded like a herd of elephants was running around the bedroom next door, the landing and the room below. Paul checked many times, but as soon as he got out of bed to investigate, the noises stopped. That night was the last straw, and Mary went to the local vicar for help. After some questioning of the family, the vicar decided to perform an exorcism, but he insisted that no family member should attend, only himself and a fellow cleric to assist him. At 4pm on a windy December afternoon, the exorcism took place, whilst Paul, Mary and Brian stayed with their next door neighbours. After an hour of waiting, they were all beginning to wonder what was going on. Paul even put a wine glass to the partition wall to see if he could hear what was happening but heard nothing. In the end, they waited for a total of four hours before the vicar called round to say that the exorcism was complete. The vicar would not reveal what had happened but he seemed satisfied that the exorcism had worked. That awful smell was gone. In fact, subsequent visitors remarked how pleasant the house was now, no odd smells, no hint of burnt cabbage. From that day, Paul and Mary suffered no more awful incidents. Brian eventually grew up and he went his own way in life, 
moving out at the age of 25 to be married to a girl from London, and here they started their own life. Paul and Mary, now grandparents themselves, still live in the house which once gave them such a terrifying time. They seem none the worse for this strange experience, although Paul still does occasionally tease Mary about her insistence on having air fresheners in every room, just in case. Oh, well, that's spooky stuff, wasn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, as I'm reading these stories, I sometimes wonder if I've read them before in a previous video, but I leave such a long gap in between them that I sometimes forget what I've read before and what I haven't, so forgive me if I repeat myself in these videos. The next story comes from the book Supernatural England, Poltergeist, Ghosts and Hauntings, edited by Betty Puttick. This section is titled Mysterious Music. George Aitishin, journalist and author of Unknown Brighton, was of the opinion that ghostly sounds were the last vestiges of a haunting. By inference it follows that soon there would be nothing left at all. However, it may be that mysterious music comes in a category of its own and is not dependent on other ghostly manifestations. One of the best documented cases of supernatural music relates to the chanting monks of Poling. Martha Bates, who was born in 1870, had always been interested in ghosts. Perhaps it ran in the family because as a small child she had listened to her grandfather's stories about the Sussex ghosts. Although these were told on dark evenings in the winter beside a flickering flame, she seems to have been enthralled rather than frightened. When she became a young lady with her hair swept up and wore the long-sleeved and high-necked dresses of the period, she began keeping a journal of her ghostly experiences. She had heard about the monks at polling, and nothing would satisfy her except hearing the chanting for herself. She obtained permission from the owner of the house and she persuaded a relative to accompany her. Her companion was the most carefully chosen because he was a professor of music and she judged that he would be able to identify any obscure music they might hear. He must have been a very patient man or perhaps young Martha had infected him with some of her enthusiasm. At any rate they spent six long nights in a fruitless vigil. On the last night they were sitting in a corridor in the oldest part of the house, huddled in blankets to try and keep warm, when they heard the chanting. It started off softly, as though in the distance, and then it became louder, as though a procession of monks were walking invisibly past them, and then the chanting faded away onto the other side. The professor had no hesitation in stating that the music was a Gregorian funeral chant. Confirmation of the phenomenon was provided by Philip M. Johnstone, whose brother Sir Harry Hamilton Johnstone owned the old farmhouse at Poling. Philip was an authority on Sussex churches, and it was he who heard the chanting on several occasions when he went to stay with his brother. At first Philip was too surprised to register anything except the unexpectedness of the chanting, but as he became more familiar with the experience he noticed that the chant was always the same. He was able to write down the notes that he heard and he sent the score to a friend who knew about ancient music. The friend identified it as a Gregorian setting of the Deus Miserator, the 67th psalm used at funerals. Philip Johnstone told the story to George Aitchison and to Arthur Beckett, author and editor of the Sussex County Magazine, and they both had no doubts about accepting the truth of it. The Church of St Andrew, Diddling, southwest of Midhurst, is small and stands by itself and is much praised for the antiquity and solidity of its pews. In the 1940s it became noted for something else, its ghostly choir. What is particularly interesting is that the eyewitness accounts differ as to whether it was a single voice or a choir. In autumn of 1926, Z.A. Tickner went to visit his friends who had recently moved house. He had never been to Diddling before, so he decided to explore. He walked around the farm, and on being told where he could find a key, he decided to look inside the church. It was midday and the sun was shining, there was no sound from either farm machinery or traffic in the lane. Yet, as he pushed open the door, he distinctly heard the sound of men's voices singing plain song. He looked again outside the church, but nothing stirred, and when he entered the church the singing had stopped. 
He searched around inside the little church, even peeping behind the curtain, but there was nobody there. He then went back and swung the door on its hinge, but there was no sound of creaking. He never told anyone about his experience until years later. On the other hand, the late Reverend W. W. Whistler was certain that the ghost voice was a single, very pure soprano. He was taking an afternoon service one Sunday and his congregation consisted of a handful of worshippers, all adult and some elderly. He was greatly astonished when he heard this pure voice singing in tune with the hymn and he knew that none of his flock could sing like that. He heard it two or three times, singing a line or two of the hymn and then fading. The lady organist was delighted when he told her because she had heard the voice on several occasions and she had not liked to mention it before. This story was printed in the Sussex County Magazine in 1943 and soon prompted Z.A. Tickner to write in and tell about his experience there. Unexplained music of a secular sort had been heard at Yapton. A recently retired man of 60, accompanied by his elderly parents, had taken up temporary residence at Yapton whilst he searched for a suitable plot of ground on which to build a bungalow. One evening in the spring of 1956, two days after his arrival at Yapton, he was taking a stroll at around 9.30pm. It was a peaceful walk beside the old elms and high wall with here and there a cottage. He was surprised to hear the unmistakable sound of a lively polka being played on a quartet of stringed instruments. He felt sure that a party was in progress and that when he rounded the corner he would see a big house alive with lights and the noise of people within, but all he found was an ordinary cottage with no brilliant lights. He stood there for about ten minutes listening to the polka music, imagining that perhaps the party was being held at the back out of sight. It puzzled him that only the polka was being played and no other sort of dance. He also found it strange that when he had moved several hundred yards from the cottage, he could still hear the polka as clearly as when he'd been standing outside. He went to bed just after midnight, and he dreamed that he heard the polka being played twice over on a single violin. Strange to relate, the following morning his parents said to him that he ought not to play his gramophone so late at night. They too had heard the polka played twice over. But the man didn't own such a record, and besides, his record player was still packed up and there was no power points in the bedroom. The only likely explanation is that the music from a long ago party came through that night for some reason. The polka was a bohemian dance which originated in about 1830. When it was introduced to this country it became a sensation. No doubt the older folk disapproved mightily and thought it was the height of decadence, whilst for younger people a party with polka after polka would have been very popular. Interesting, interesting, okay. So the next one comes from It Happened to Me, Volume 4, Real Life Tales of the Paranormal. And I can tell from this title that it's going to be a weird one. It's called Wardrobe Dwarves. One night, in 1984, after a week away at a work-related seminar, I returned home to an empty house. My children were staying elsewhere whilst I was away. It was around 9.30 in the evening. I'd slept through my flights and the drive home, so I was well rested. After turning on the lights, making a cup of tea and turning on the TV, I decided to unpack my suitcase. I went into my bedroom, slid back the sliding door to the built-in wardrobe and commenced hanging up some clothes. Within seconds I was overcome by sleepiness to the point where I staggered backwards and lay full length on the bed, shoes and all. I told myself I'd just lie down for a few minutes before continuing my plans for the night. The last thing I remember was seeing the ceiling light which looked incredibly bright. The next thing I was aware of was the sound of several voices, all urging each other to hurry, hurry. I don't know if they were really speaking English or even if they were speaking aloud, but this was just the way it seemed. It took a lot of effort to raise my head and look down to the foot of the bed where the voices were. There were several small people tugging on my legs. They were trying to pull me from the bed and into the open wardrobe. It didn't seem odd to me. I wasn't afraid. I looked at them briefly and told myself I was too big and heavy for them to move far. I decided it was safe for me to close my eyes for a few more minutes. Then I looked up and the small people were standing around me, looking at me silently. 
They were about two or two and a half feet tall. There were males and females. They looked like gnomes or dwarves. They were stocky and their skin was very coarse and weathered as if they'd spent a lot of time outdoors. They looked at me the way you stare, unmoving and silent when a child starts waking up. On these occasions you say nothing in the hope that the child will drift off to sleep again. Well, that's the way they stared at me. They were not kindly nor were they overly hostile. They seemed to regard me as nothing. They had absolutely no compassion or sympathy for me. They didn't seem overly intelligent but they were determined. They were joyless. They just wanted me to go to sleep again or whatever state it was that kept overwhelming me. At that point I must have become unconscious again. The odd part is, at that point when they were gathered around me, I was reversed in position on the bed. My head was where my feet had been moments earlier. Sometime later I again heard their argumentative voices urging each other to hurry. As before it took a lot of effort to raise my head and open my eyes. When I did, I experienced a huge shock of adrenaline because I could see that they'd managed to drag me a lot further from the bed. My legs were almost totally off the bed at this point. I grasped instantly that I'd awoken just in time. A little bit more and gravity would have done the rest of the work for them and they would only have needed to steer my falling body into the open wardrobe. Again, the scenario didn't seem strange to me, which is ridiculous. Nor was I afraid of these little people, which again is illogical. It flashed through my mind that it was my own fault for allowing myself to lie back down. I began kicking out at these little people and screaming at them. I still wasn't afraid of them at that point, I was angry with them. They muttered and groaned amongst themselves, they realised that I was not going to lie back down this time. I jumped from the bed into the middle of the room which wasn't very large. The light in the room seemed incredibly bright and that's something that I've always remembered. From the middle of the room I continued to yell at the dwarves or whatever they were. They gave me resentful looks and then began walking into the open side of the built-in wardrobe. It still didn't seem strange that they existed. They seemed to walk in and down and incline inside the wardrobe. When they were gone I remained in the centre of the room in the bright light for a few seconds. Up to that point I wasn't afraid, nor was I in a state of mind to question what had just occurred. Then I suspect my mind began to return to normal. I ran from the bedroom and into the living room. It was at this juncture that I fell apart in every way. It was very sudden. I was just overcome with terror, shock, panic and hysteria. It was very acute. I couldn't breathe or think. I was close to being out of my mind with fear and it had no real focus. It was just a hideous terror. I was reduced to the level of a very small terrified child in the space of a few seconds. I phoned a friend who had travelled back with me from the seminar. I couldn't get my breath or speak properly and I don't know what I said but he said he would come straight over. The house was unbearable, I couldn't stand to be in there. All I wanted was to be with others, even strangers, I ran out into the street. All the houses were dark although there were a few cracks of light showing behind some of the curtains. I tried to call out but my voice wouldn't work, all I could do was make noises and sobs. I stayed there on the road until my friend drove up. He looked terrified when he walked towards me. I couldn't talk. He pushed me into the car and said he'd lock up my house for me. And we drove to his place. I didn't speak all the way. He put me in a spare room and covered me with lots of blankets. I was freezing and I couldn't get warm. Nor could I bear to be alone or in the dark. In the end, he spent the night in a chair next to my bed with the lights on. The next day when I got up I felt weak and dazed, very fragile, very unsure. My friend, a logical, practical and sceptical person, didn't want to discuss my experience. I wanted to tell someone about what had happened though, so I told him some very brief details. I asked if he thought I'd gone crazy. He said he knew I wasn't, but didn't want to even speculate on what might or might not have occurred, other than to say that he'd never seen anyone as scared as I'd been when he found me. We never discussed it again, although we continued to work together for another 14 years. He was in a perfect position to know that I had been perfectly normal, only an hour before I'd called him in hysterics. <laughs>
he had travelled with me on the plane and the drive from the airport. He knows I don't drink or take drugs and that I'd been perfectly normal during the week-long seminar. We worked out that whatever had occurred after I arrived home had taken place within three quarters of an hour or less. I never told anyone about my experience with the little people. I was too embarrassed and it sounded too ridiculous. Ten years later, my daughter, then aged 20, revealed that she had seen the dwarves or gnomes when she was small and she'd been terrified of them. She told me that they'd come out of the wardrobe, the same one they'd tried to pull me into. I asked why she'd never told me about this. She said she'd known, even as a small child, that I wouldn't believe her and would have told her that it was all her imagination or a dream. She was right. That's exactly what I would have said. If someone else reported an experience like this, I'd probably put it down to a lucid dream. That's the problem. And these things happen, but when we hear about them, we seldom believe that it's true. But for the experiencer, it's a different matter. We can't convince others, nor do most of us care to try. I've since reached the conclusion that the reason these creatures, whatever they are, sometimes take the form of dwarves or gnomes is because nobody believes in the existence of such things. Either that or my mind saw them as dwarves, rather than acknowledge what they really are, whatever that might have been. Okay, that was nice and spooky, wasn't it? Uh, here's another story I think I picked just purely for the title. It comes from the book True Ghost Stories from Around the World, Volume 2. Better Stop, You're Next, by Debbie Dickinson. In March 1980, the Psychical Research Foundation in Durham, North Carolina, received a call from a Chicago woman who reported that strange things were happening in her house. Furniture was moving by itself, water was being turned on and off by some unseen force, there were knocks on the door and footsteps were heard upstairs with no one there in either case. She also noted the presence of a mysterious cold spot in the cellar and sounds of a chain jangling or being dragged across the attic floor. The house belonged to the caller whom I shall call Mrs. Smith because she insisted that her name and the names of her family members and the location of her home be kept strictly confidential. She said that she'd consulted the psychic who told her that two spirits lived in the house, an older male about 200 years old and a young girl who'd met a tragic death years ago. According to the psychic, their spirits were suspended in time, trapped in the limbo of the early realm. In March, I happened to be in Durham, attending the memorial service of Dr. J. B. Ryan, the famed researcher of extrasensory perception, with whom I'd been acquainted since 1975. The next day, I met with some people at the Psychical Research Foundation. Knowing I was from Chicago and had some background in parapsychology and the paranormal, they asked me if I'd be interested in investigating the phenomena reported by the Chicago woman. Since I was the only person who at the time was free to take on the projects, I called Mrs. Smith when I returned to Chicago and told her that I would take the case. Background investigation showed that the house was built in 1897 on the site of an old Native American burial ground. Mrs. Smith had lived there with her husband and two daughters who were then in their twenties, a son who was 18 whom I shall call John and a dog. For many years, the daughters had been holding satanic masses upstairs and playing satanic records in Latin and regularly using a Ouija board. The activity now occurring centred on John, but it occurred even when he was absent. It was well documented that paranormal happenings with children present at the age of puberty or adolescence may indicate poltergeist activity. I listened with interest as Mrs Smith told me her story. I was sceptical but determined to remain open-minded. Whatever the investigation revealed, the family needed help. With my background in clinical psychology, I was more inclined to think the family needed counselling and I was sure a logical explanation for the disturbances could be found. My fiancé Kurt was assisting me. He had no background in the paranormal but I knew he could be totally objective. He works with a major company in scientific observation and methods. I knew he'd be a great help to me in collecting data and would give me an unbiased opinion and critique afterwards. With us working together as a team, I felt confident that we'd solved the case. 
Not much time would pass before we learned that some things defy all logic and reason. Kurt and I met with Mrs Smith at her house one week after the initial phone call. I had a list of questions to ask her as well as a camera and a tape recorder to record our interview. By taping the interview I would have the whole story in Mrs Smith's own words. I would be free to observe her reaction rather than write notes. Through my clinical training I knew a great deal of information can be obtained by observing facial expressions and body movements and listening closely to vocal intonations and speech patterns. John would be interviewed separately that day. It is standard procedure to interview people separately to see where they agree or differ. All of the occupants were under surveillance at the time of investigation to make sure that no confederate was responsible for the disturbances. We were alert to any optical illusions or sound effects but we found none. Kurt checked the house before and during the investigation and no children or other people were outside. Except for John and Mrs Smith we were alone, or so we thought, in the house. No windows were open and it was quiet outside. No television sets or radios were on in the house. Our list of things to investigate included checking the possibility that the disturbances were caused by high frequency radio waves, vibrations, drafts, creaking timbers, subsidence of the land under the house, underground streams, faulty plumbing or wiring, or rodents. Once sure that none of these were involved we proceeded with the interview downstairs where most of the activity either occurred or could be heard. Mrs Smith first showed us the area near the boiler in the cellar where the cold spot could often be detected. We noticed nothing unusual, the room was warm and of even temperature. When we checked back an hour later however the spot was ice cold. One foot away from the spot the air was warm. The cold spot had sharply defined edges creating a steep temperature drop in the space of only one inch. The boiler was on since April in Chicago can be chilly. I kept my composure but inside I was a little shaken. We went back to the main part of the room to talk further. The dog was there and suddenly he started running around in circles and barking at the air. The dog had been calm and friendly when we arrived. Just as suddenly the dog stopped barking and lay down whining. The tape recorder was running the whole time. One morning the dog was discovered in a locked room although no one admitted having locked him in there. My first thought was maybe the boy had been sleepwalking and locked up the dog. When we checked the lock it was found that this wouldn't have been possible. The lock was hard to manage even by a person fully awake. The lock had a double bolt action and required a key for opening. On other occasions the dog barked and acted as if he were following an invisible something or someone around the room. Mrs Smith showed us a hidden staircase which led to an attic where she said footsteps were often heard accompanied by the sound of a chain jangling or being dragged. As I focused my camera to take a picture of the opening it appeared to be blocked by a white filmy substance. I was stunned and I moved the camera away from my face and when I looked again whatever had been there was gone. I told the others what I had seen and Kurt examined my camera and pronounced it mechanically sound. Something had been there. But what? Mrs Smith let us borrow the Latin satanic records the girls had used in their black masses. Out of curiosity I wanted to play them, promising to return them at our next meeting. When I got home I put the records away with other albums. A few days later when I looked for the satanic records I found that they disappeared. About a month later the records reappeared where I'd first put them. How or why they vanished and then reappeared was never determined. When I got home from the interview I at once transcribed the tape of the session. The first sounds on the tape were tinkling bells followed by a deep husky male voice saying better stop you're next. There was a pause then and you're next. I shut the tape recorder off and screamed for Kurt. When I told him what was on the tape he thought I was joking until he saw that my horror was genuine. We played the tape again and again we were alarmed to hear that we'd picked up voices and sounds that had not been present during the interview. The bizarre messages didn't interfere with our conversation, rather they occurred during the pauses. The mysterious voices were clearly audible. The other noises on the tape 
The sound of a chain jangling, heavy footsteps and tinkling bells could be heard throughout our conversation. The bell-like sound at the beginning of the tape is known in occult lore as an astral bell, which is said to signify the entering of a spirit into our earthly dimension. The astral bell is also heard, occultists claim, when the spirit departs this world and returns to his own. Also on the tape was a young girl's voice playfully saying, Here doggy doggy, here doggy doggy. Other young children could be heard laughing. We estimate that this coincided with the time that the Smith's dog started running around in circles and barking at something invisible to the rest of us. The dog's bark could be heard on the tape. As our interview continued, there was a sound of an inhuman voice speaking some unknown language in a pitch that defies description. Phonetically, it sounded like bot knee, bot knee socks. The tape wasn't malfunctioning and our conversation could be clearly heard at all times. When Mrs. Smith told us that a psychic claimed that the spirits of a young girl and an old man were living in the house, I thought it sounded insane. I didn't tell her that I was sceptical about spirits, but when the tape was played, a young girl could be heard saying, in a high-pitched, airy voice, she doesn't believe in me. I know to whom this statement was directed. I asked some neighbours if they would listen to the tape. I didn't reveal what was on it because I didn't want to influence them in any way. I still hoped Kurt and I were imagining things. Taking them individually into another room after they listened to our tape, I asked them what they'd heard. They all reported hearing just what we had heard. Even stranger, the more we played the tape, the more noises and messages appeared independently of the interview we'd done. Neither Kurt or I slept well that night. On Monday, I called the Psychical Research Foundation and reported what had happened. The people there were interested and said that they would send us a blank tape. We were instructed to arrange a second interview with Mrs. Smith and John and tape it to see if we could replicate what was on the first tape. A copy of the first tape was mailed to the Foundation for examination. How had those voices and sounds appeared on the tape? Fraud was ruled out. Some of the voices on the tape were different from ordinary human voices. The messages were, without doubt, directed at Kurt and me. We concluded that the taped voices were produced paranormally. Before long, strange things began to happen in our flat. One day we decided to play the tape for some friends. We went to get it from the box in which we kept it, but it was gone. Neither Kurt nor I had touched it since locking it away. We joked with our friends saying that it had disappeared like the satanic records we'd borrowed. Kurt fetched the tape player to listen to some musical recordings our friends had brought along. He discovered the interview tape inside. Someone or something was anxious to be heard. One night my fiancé awoke out of a sound sleep to see a ball of blue-white light dancing around the bedroom and on the walls. Our second floor bedroom faced the woods, no street light car lights or reflections could account for the source. Kurt woke me up, but the moment I turned to look, the ball of light vanished. I never saw it, and Kurt wishes he hadn't. The next morning I was awakened at three o'clock by the sound of the kitchen cabinets opening and closing four times in succession. My first thought was that Kurt was getting a snack. I was startled to find him sleeping soundly beside me. The noise didn't wake him. When I checked the kitchen, no one was there. The slamming sounds reoccurred several nights in a row at approximately the same time. Our dog began acting strangely in our dining room. He was continually looking up at the recessed lighting and suddenly ducking as if something was swooping down at him. He would yelp and retreat to the far end of the flat with his tail tucked between his legs. I decided to visit several ministers and relate what was happening. I was hesitant, fearing that they would recommend I take a long rest at our local mental health facility. Instead, they listened to the tape and urged that I lock it up and never play it again. Whatever we'd captured on that tape was gaining strength and force with each replay. We were told not to discard or destroy the tape, since that might let loose whatever was on it. The ministers felt that there was something demonic about the whole situation, but they didn't want to get involved. Our lease soon expired and we moved to a new home. Fortunately, that brought the disturbances to an end. Our dog's behaviour immediately returned to normal. 
After much contemplation, I decided for my own sanity and safety not to pursue the Smith case any further. If I had not experienced the phenomena myself, I would not have believed them possible. They're something that we live through and will never be able to forget. Okay, I'd love to hear that tape. I wonder if it still exists. So the next story comes from It Happened to Me, Volume 6. I've got a strange feeling that I might have already read this one out, but I'm going to read it again just in case. It's called Singing Ghost. Back in 1986, when I was 11, I used to tape the top 40 charts on a Sunday afternoon at my grandmother's house. We visited her every week for tea. I would record the chart countdown in her bedroom using a cassette recorder that belonged to my grandfather. The setup was quite primitive. I would place the microphone next to the radio on her bedside table and just let it record. I shared my bedroom at the time with my older brother. We would often listen to the charts when we were in bed before falling asleep. One particular cassette had the top 10 on it. I remember Madonna was number one, so it must have been July. We'd listened to it a couple of times. After the charts had finished, the tape had about five minutes of silence and it would stop at the end. One night during this silence, at the end of the tape, our grandfather's voice appeared singing. We both jumped out of bed and replayed the tape. It was definitely our grandfather singing in a creepy lullaby style. La 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 la. It lasted maybe 15 to 10 seconds, but I remember it vividly. The oddest thing was that his voice was surrounded by what we could only describe as hundreds of pieces of paper constantly flying around him. He had died the year before and we decided not to mention it to our mum who had taken his death very badly. I eventually threw the cassette away being spooked a little too much by it. It was definitely not on the tape before that night. My strangest experience however happened in 2004. I put my one year old daughter to bed in her cot and went downstairs when she was asleep. My wife was at work and there was no one else in the house. We had baby monitors set up, one in the living room and the other in my daughter's room. I was watching TV when I heard rattling on the monitor and I knew instantly that it was the baby activity centre. I can remember getting up and cursing the dog that I assumed had gone upstairs and knocked it. However, the dog was in the passage and the baby gates were closed at the bottom of the stairs. The activity centre was in the doorway of my daughter's room and I had to move it to get into the room. My daughter was still fast asleep. As you can imagine, I was freaked out by it. There was no rational explanation. Alright, the next story comes from one of my favourite ghost story books, Trucker Ghost Stories, edited by Annie Wilder. The story is titled Turnpike to the Twilight Zone. It was early November of 1979. I had just moved back to my hometown of Pittsburgh from the Colorado Rockies. On a grey Sunday afternoon I was bored and restless and decided to catch a movie at the local theatre about a mile or so away. I looked up at the sky as I got out of my car several blocks from the movie house. Overhead the soggy graphite clouds were ready to burst. If it was raining when the show let out, I'd be sopping wet and freezing cold by the time I got back to my old station wagon. I didn't wear a jacket. A few hours later as I left the theatre, I saw a major cloudburst looming just seconds away in the dark, swirling skies above me. I made a dash for my car, jumped in and closed the door just as the rain fell in buckets and my wipers began to flap back and forth. In the deluge, they were all but a formality as I began the slow crawl home. Although I hadn't been in town for several years, I knew exactly where I was. Go down this street, make a left, follow a mile and… wait a second. I must have made a wrong turn in this crazy storm. I was now heading down a long steep road that I'd never seen before. I look out for a place to turn around but none appears, so I just keep going farther down this weird winding road that looks like it is in the middle of a country, not the urban neighbourhood I'd just left with the delis and chain pharmacies. Finally I saw a turn off 50 feet before me, I look at the sign. The name of the street wasn't familiar but I calculated that it would take me back in the direction I wanted to go. Yet the further I went down this road, the stranger I started to feel. Nothing seemed even remotely familiar, in a way that's hard to describe. Every city has its own look and feel, Los Angeles simply doesn't look like Cincinnati, and this 
didn't look like Pittsburgh. I guessed it was just an area I hadn't been to before. After five minutes of driving through Lord knows where, I banged my steering wheel and started to curse. But my anger was almost fake, more of a nervous reaction. I was not angry at being lost, I was secretly freaked out at being... No, I was lost. That's, that's all it was, I was lost. At this point I had the existential realisation that when you're normally lost you have some idea of where you are. The city anyway. But right then, if I had the guts to admit it to myself, I would have to say I am somewhere far, far away. The sun comes out and it's now a sparkling blue sky. I look up at the brilliant sun. Boy, that was quick. I drove for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30. Nothing looked even remotely familiar anymore. At that point I was laughing and making half insane crude remarks as road signs read names I knew were not from the area. Eucalyptus Avenue. Why of course, lots of freaking eucalyptus in Pittsburgh. Now I know exactly where I am, by the ocean. Jesus H. Christ, this is insane. I mean, insane. Then, Eureka, a sign for the turnpike. Oh, thank you, almighty God in heaven, thank you. I knew the Pennsylvania turnpike like the back of my hand. To get home, all I needed to do was find exit 7, and no matter where in bleeding hell I was now, I'd be home in 15 minutes once I found exit 7. Thank you, exit 7, wherever you are. I pulled up to the on-ramp of the turnpike. Hmm... That's interesting. There is no one in the toll booth. Empty. I looked behind me. No cars. I was going to ask the attendant where I was, but... Sweet mother. I swore under my breath as I pulled up to the toll booth. But hey, it's no big deal. It's automated. That's why there's no one there. I took my ticket from the automated machine and drove onto the turnpike and looked at the card. Hmm, where is exit 7? Where is exit 7? It's not on the card. And the names of the exits, the cities. What are these? Jamesburg? Where am I? Maryland? And as I drove down what I realise now is a brand new turnpike, I also noticed something else. There's no cars on it. Not one going either way. Brand spanking new turnpike, completely empty, for miles and miles. And then I realised... Oh shit, am I on a new turnpike that isn't meant for traffic yet? I drove for 10 minutes, miles and miles of two lane, perfectly paved, brand new, empty turnpike. 15 minutes and still no cars. So now I realised I had to turn around, I know it's a huge fine, but what else am I supposed to do? I find a crossover, make the U-turn, and start preparing my story to tell the toll booth guy, assuming he was just away on a pee break or something and he'll be there when I get back. I looked out at the miles and miles of empty turnpike. Why are they building a brand new turnpike anyway? This must cost gazillions. We already have a turnpike for Christ's sakes. Oh, here's the exit. Okay, prepare the story. But, uh, no, nobody at the toll booth. In fact, the toll gate is up. I drove through. Oh, thank you. No $375 fine. Okay, now, do I make a left or a right? I made a left, and then, after only a minute or so, there it is. A road I recognised. It shouldn't be here, 30 minutes from where I started, but what the hell, I know this road. My relief almost brings me to tears, and the road took me home. How was the movie, my mother asked as I walked into the kitchen. Oh, it was okay, but man, you wouldn't believe how lost I got. I didn't know they were building a new turnpike. I was on that thing at least 20 minutes, but not one car. It was bizarre. My mother furrowed her brow. My dad smiled. What? Isn't there a new turnpike? I don't think so, my mother said. No, not that I've heard of, my dad said. They looked at me blankly, knowingly, like I just unwittingly admitted that I'd been smoking some serious pot over the last few hours. For a few days afterwards, I asked around, nope, no new turnpike. Fifteen years later, I was at a conference in Los Angeles where the speaker, Carlos Castaneda, electrified us with one of his most outlandish tales of sorcery. One day, Taisha was driving, he says. We were driving down the Alhambra when we look around and suddenly, poof, we don't know where we are. We drove into another world. He smiles broadly, barely able to contain himself. 
I tell you, be careful when you drive down steep, winding roads like this one, he cautions. Apparently once a great river flowed down this road, but now, even though it's long since dried up, the great energy of the river still flows, and here it can take you away. Everyone in the audience giggles nervously at this silly story. I laugh too, when something abruptly takes me back. I remember that steep, winding road, the ghost turnpike, the shuddering realisation of being lost in another world. From 50 feet away, Carlos turns from the crowd and imperceptibly pointed a finger at me, smiling. He knows, he said quietly, raising his eyebrows playfully. I continue to live in Pittsburgh, and I still do to this day, but it was many years before I had a reason to be back in the neighbourhood where the event first unfolded. Something about the area, the streets, continued to impart a disturbing mood in me. As though I couldn't be anywhere near the theatre without feeling I was standing on a high dive for the first time, looking down, knowing it was too late to turn back. Then, one afternoon, a strange urge came over me, almost like I was hypnotised. I found myself driving my car right to the corner of the avenue where I'd parked those many years ago. I casually looked over like I was at my 20 year reunion facing the bully who had tormented me in high school, and I got a chill when I saw the name of the theatre. Forward Avenue, as though it truly is an otherworldly launch pad that thrusts you forward and out of this world into who knows where. Well, that was very spooky, wasn't it, guys? Okay, next one is from a, a book called Scottish Ghosts by Lily Seafield, and it's about Blytheswood Square in Glasgow. Bliveswood Square, in the centre of Glasgow, is a square of fine Georgian buildings with a mixed history. Now the site of offices of lawyers and accountants, it once had a reputation as being something of a red light district. In the years before that, it was more of a residential area, considered to be a very desirable place to live. One particular gentleman, house hunting in that area, came upon a house in Bliveswood Square up for sale. Upon inspecting the property, he was very impressed with it all, with the exception of the bathroom. There was something about the bathroom that gave the house a very unpleasant air, and the gentleman couldn't quite put his finger on what it was. The room had a cold and dreary atmosphere, but there was something else, something foreboding. The room made him shudder. Nevertheless, the thought of having a prestigious address such as this was too tempting for both the gentleman and his wife. The bathroom would surely take on a brighter atmosphere with a few coats of fresh paint and new fittings. They bought the house and moved in. The gentleman still felt very uneasy about using the bathroom in spite of its bright new appearance and in spite of his family's reassurances that all was normal. He didn't like to close the door when he was taking a bath. His wife, however, protested at such immodest behaviour. Reluctantly, the gentleman had to respect her wishes. The next time he went to take a bath, he summoned up the courage to close the door behind him. The gentleman could see that there was nobody else in the bathroom, but in spite of this, he still had the distinct feeling that there was somebody else there. It was uncanny. Trying to ignore his feelings of misgivings, he placed his candle at the edge of the bath, undressed and stepped into the water. Hardly had the gentleman got into the bath, however, that he heard strange sounds coming from the fire grate. He tried to ignore them, but they persisted. He got up to investigate, his heart hammering. Cautiously, he stepped out of the bath, and suddenly his candle went out and the room was plunged into darkness. The gentleman tripped and fell onto the floor. Frozen with terror, he then heard the sounds of loud splashing coming from the bath. Somebody was in the bath, washing. But that was impossible, there was nobody there. The gentleman hardly had time to ponder upon this, for after only a few seconds he heard the cupboard door behind him opening. A figure stepped out of the cupboard. The gentleman could hear the rustling of skirts and smell the cloying scent of perfume. The gentleman had no time to get out of the ghostly figure's way. A chilly foot in a high-heeled shoe stepped on his back quite carelessly as the spectre of a woman, apparently oblivious to the gentleman's presence, made her way towards the bath. The gentleman gasped and listened. The sounds of a struggle came from the bath, a violent struggle. There was much splashing and thrashing about, and then, all of a sudden, the noises stopped. 
The woman turned to face the gentleman, and through the darkness he saw a ghostly white face startling in its luminosity. The face was obviously that of a beautiful woman, but it was contorted with an expression of pure hatred. The gentleman had seen and heard enough. He fumbled his way to the bathroom door, unlocked it, and fled to the safety of his bedroom. When he told his wife what had happened, he was met with ridicule and told not to be so foolish. His fear was dismissed as mere hysteria. Then one morning, the gentleman's son went to use the bathroom and was greeted with the sight of a dead man floating in the bathwater. His screams alerted the rest of the family who came running. When they went into the bathroom, they could see nothing, but when they were coming out, they were all witness to the sight of a beautiful, dark-haired woman, a look of unmistakable hatred on her face sweeping past them into the bathroom cupboard. The family left the house. No matter how desirable the address, the spectral inhabitants made life there unbearable. Once they had found themselves a suitable, less sinister place to live, they made inquiries about the history of the house in Bliveswood Square. Their investigations were quite enlightening. Apparently the house had once been the property of a wealthy man married to a Spanish woman with a violent temper. The man had been found drowned in his bath one morning. The circumstances had been suspicious but no foul play could be proved and his beautiful widow left the country. The gentleman and his family knew the terrible truth about what had happened, and the gentleman now realised that what he'd experienced was the ghostly reenactment of the whole sordid affair. Very good, very good. So, next story and the final book on our list is The A to Z of British Ghosts by Peter Underwood. And the story concerns Langenhoe near Colchester in Essex. Until a few years ago, a haunted church stood like a sentinel near the manor house, looking out over the desolate marshes, certainly the most haunted church that I've ever come across. As soon as I heard about the curious happenings, I spent several hours with the rector, the Reverend E. A. Merriweather, who regaled me with the story of the strange experiences he'd vouched for. I examined the diary in which he'd recorded the events at the time that they'd taken place. Later he presented me with this diary. I found Mr. Merriweather to be a large, astute and kindly man, then in his sixties, level-headed and sensible, with an infectious sense of humour and a gift for looking on the bright side of things. Before coming to Langenhoe in 1937, he'd spent most of his life in the north of England and had previously experienced no psychic manifestations of any kind, nor was he interested in the subject. Doubtless because he was at the church more frequently than anyone else, he had experienced himself much of the alleged paranormal phenomena. The first happenings for which he could find no explanation were typical poltergeist activity, door slamming and paranormal locking. Yes, it wasn't long before things happened that suggested to me that there was something odd about this place, the rector said as I remarked on the date of the first diary entry. I visited the church on September the 20th, 1937. It was a quiet autumn day. I was standing alone in the church and the big west door was open. Suddenly it crashed to with such a force that the whole building seemed to shake. Doors don't usually slam to as if an express train has hit them when there's no palpable reason. This aroused my curiosity as to the cause. Twice during November 1937, the rector's valise, in which he carried his books and vestments, was found to be unaccountably locked whilst he was in the vestry, all efforts to unlock it proving to be entirely unsuccessful while in the vicinity of the church, although on each occasion when he was outside in the lane the valise unlocked without any difficulty. On the first occasion, a friend of the rector also witnessed this locking. There was little further to report until 1945 when, on Easter Sunday, there occurred the first of a number of incidents concerning flowers. Mrs Gertrude Barnes and her daughter Irene were helping Mr Merriweather decorate the church before the congregation arrived and they'd placed some flowers in a vase on the pew whilst attending to some other matter. A moment later, Mrs Barnes found the flowers removed from the vase and laid on the pew. Later, there were other incidents where the flowers were moved and unaccountably appeared or disappeared. 
During the autumn of 1947, Mr. Merriweather called at the manor house and walked into, quite literally, a tactual phenomenon which was almost unique in the annals of psychical research. He was shown over the house by the late Mrs. Cutting and entered a charming front bedroom which Mrs. Cutting said she did not use as there was something queer about it. She preferred to sleep in the bedroom facing north, even though the view over the marshes was much less attractive. She stayed in the room with Mr. Merriweather only a few seconds and then left him saying, I don't like this room. Left alone, the rector, after admiring the grand sweeping view for a moment, turned from the window and, as he told me, he moved into an unmistakable embrace of a naked young woman. This singular, tactual phenomena lasted only a few seconds. One wild, frantic embrace and she was gone. But the rector was quite emphatic that he'd had this most unusual experience and had no doubt whatever that it was just as he'd described it. There existed absolutely no doubt about it in his mind. Nothing auditory, visual or olfactory accompanied this experience. Several times in 1948 while celebrating Holy Communion, the rector and members of the congregation heard thuds from the direction of the vestry door. Upon investigation, nothing was ever visible and no explanation or cause for the noise was ever found. The thuds continued with some regularity for about a month and thereafterwards heard intermittently. Reference to the rector's diary shows that they were heard ten times between July and December 1948 and on November the 11th that year, whilst busy raking coal at the side of the church with an iron rod, the rector suddenly sensed that someone or something was near him in the deserted churchyard. He stuck the rod into the coal and, taking off his beretta, hung it on the end of the rod as a test. To his amazement, the hat began to revolve slowly in front of his eyes. Five minutes later, he heard a voice in the empty church. For some time past there had been a certain amount of hooliganism on part of some boys staying at a nearby village. People had been attacked whilst out walking in the lonely lanes, so the rector, visiting his isolated church, decided to go armed and selected a wicked-looking dirk or dagger which his son had sent him from Cyprus. He placed the dagger firmly in his belt beneath his cassock. After the Beretta incident, Mr. Merriweather went into the church and, as he was standing before the altar, he felt his dagger suddenly pulled from his belt and it was flung onto the floor at his feet. He heard a female voice say, You are a cruel man. In answer to my question as to the direction from which the voice came from, the rector said he thought that it came from the tower end of the church, that is, behind him as he faced the altar. On December the 2nd, 1948, the rector and a number of parishioners heard a series of unexplained noises which seemed to originate from the direction which seemed to originate from the direction of a blocked up door that used to be the private entrance to the church for the occupants of the manor house. The noises were described to me as resembling an old man's cough. A moment later, a little brass credence bell rang of its own volition. Still later, a loud crack as of a rifle came from the same spot and a pile of stained glass was found in the chancel. During the months that followed, the credence bell rang several more times without anyone being near it. Lamps inexplicably swung, and this happened for three days in succession. A lamp mysteriously burst into flames and it had not been recently refilled. Then on August the 21st, 1949, the rector saw the apparition of a young woman in the church. He was celebrating Holy Communion at the time. He turned round to read the gospel at the altar and saw, on looking down the church, the figure of a young woman aged about 30. She was wearing a white or grey dress and flowing headgear that reached over her shoulders. She walked from the north side of the church near the window beside the tower, across the chancel, and disappeared into the corner in the southwest. The wall seemed to open, she passed in, and then the wall closed again. He noticed too that she walked with a slight stoop, and from the expression on her face and her attitude, he gained the impression that she was very unhappy. She appeared to be about 5 feet 6 inches in height, and looked like a normal person, nor was she transparent, although she made no sound. During the severe earthquake of 1884, Langenhoe Church was badly damaged. The tremors lasted almost 20 seconds. 
Photographs of the west end of the church the morning after the earthquake show the devastation, but also clearly indicate a former doorway in the internal tower wall, several feet to the right of the later doorway. In view of this fact, it is interesting to note that Mr. Merriweather insisted the phantom girl vanished into the tower wall and not through the later doorway. It was not until I began researching into the history of the area and located the photographs taken at the time of the earthquake that Mr. Merriweather saw them for the first time. During the rest of 1949, incidents included the smashing and disappearance of part of the vestry door handle, the unexplained locking of the same door, mysterious knocks and footsteps inside the church. I spent the night of September the 24th, 1949 in Langenhoe Church with a friend who had become interested in psychical research, John C. Deaning, then at the Foreign Office, and later to become the Reverend John C. Deaning. I had a number of instruments which I'd set up, I also scattered some controls throughout the church and churchyard. I sealed the doors and windows, I ringed a number of objects, and even left paper and pencils here and there in case an entity should feel inclined to leave a message. Objects that had moved or been disturbed before were under particular surveillance throughout the night. Powdered chalk was spread where the apparition had walked and where footsteps had been heard. Threads were strung across the church at strategic points. In fact, the psychical researcher's whole armoury was used in an effort to prove scientifically the existence of a paranormal being in the church during the hours of darkness, if one put up an appearance. Unfortunately, a thunderstorm raged during most of the night, and we may well have missed any auditory phenomena amidst the claps of thunder and the sounds of rain pattering on the roof. But I don't think we were in any luck, for in the morning I found all my apparatus exactly as I'd left them, and the instruments showed no abnormality. Perhaps the most lasting memory of that visit was the magnificent view from the church tower across the marshes to Mercy Island at the moment when the autumn dawn was breaking. In early 1950, Mr. Merriweather heard a female voice when he was near the south door. It sounded like it said, Ow! A few months later, a bricklayer who had once been a local bell ringer was high up on the empty church replacing tiles when he heard the church bell chime twice, loud and clear. Previously sceptical of the haunting, this experience caused him to modify his opinion considerably. Mr. Merriweather, tongue-in-cheek, wondered whether the bell ringing was a sly dig at the local bricklayer who was no longer a church bell ringer. In autumn of 1950, an apparently paranormal odour joined the wealth of unexplained phenomena at Langenhoe when the rector visited the church on September the 14th and found that a strong smell of violets permeated the whole building, completely out of season. Later the same month, whilst in the vestry, Mr. Merriweather suddenly heard the voice of a young woman singing in the church. The sounds seemed to originate from the west end of the building. He described the singing to me as resembling Gregorian plain song chanting. As the singing stopped, it was followed by the sound of a man's heavy footsteps walking with a slow and sinister tread up the nave. This was too much for the rector and he moved quickly into the church from the vestry. As he did so, the footsteps stopped abruptly and he could find nothing to account for either the singing or the footsteps. Exactly a week later, the rector paid another mid-week visit and, as he entered the churchyard, he was surprised to see two workmen crouching in front of the west end door, apparently looking through the keyhole. As they became aware of his approach, they beckoned to him to join them and listen. Even as they stood up, Mr. Merriweather guessed the reason for their interest, and sure enough, the sound of singing came from the locked and empty church. All three listened for a moment and then the singing, seemingly in French, ceased. The rector unlocked the door and took the workmen inside where they searched everywhere, even climbing the tower to satisfy themselves that there was no human being anywhere inside the church. During the following months, a cupboard door was found open, although it was always locked before the rector left the church as it contained his vestments. The following Sunday the same thing happened, and then a further four times. Never again, either before or after, during the 22 years that he was a rector of Langenhoe, was this cupboard ever found other than securely locked. On September 24th, 1950, the rector saw another apparition in the church, a figure that walked up the nave towards the chancel. 
a curious vague form that suddenly appeared from nowhere and proceeded to glide along the nave in front of him. The rector stopped in his tracks and watched the form which seemed to resemble a man in a tweed suit. It disappeared into the pulpit. On January the 28th, 1951, the white impression of a woman's hand was found on the vestry door. The rector had arrived at the church some 15 minutes before when the imprint had certainly not been there. He had gone into the churchyard to throw some dead flowers away and when he returned there it was, a full and clear imprint. This was also seen by Mr Merriweather's housekeeper and her daughter. It lasted for 10 days and then it gradually faded away. On July the 8th, 1951, the rector, during a service, again saw the girl with the flowing headdress. She was dressed exactly as before, but this time she stood facing the credence bell and the old entrance used years before by the inhabitants of the manor house. As he watched, she seemed to float towards the bricked up door and disappeared through it. A few weeks later, as he arrived at the church one morning, he was surprised to hear voices from within. He told me that he had the impression that two or perhaps three people were holding a conversation in an undertone in the chancel. One man's voice sounded more distinct than the others, although no actual words could be distinguished. A heavy sigh followed and then silence reigned. On October the 12th, 1952, the rector saw yet another apparition in the church. He was singing Psalm 119 verses 129 to 136 and he just reached the passage My eyes gush out with water because men keep not the law when he felt someone was watching him and he saw the figure of a young woman wearing a cream dress. She had an oval face and blue eyes and gave the rector a strange sad look before she vanished but the cream dress she was wearing seemed to linger for some time after the wearer was gone. Other incidents included a popping sound, the rattling of the church door handle, a loud bang, more footsteps, the organ lid moving and the curiously quick burning of a candle. There are several local stories to account for the haunting which is very ancient. Witnesses of a veiled girl figure were traced back to the turn of the century. Perhaps the most consistent one concerns a former rector who was said to have murdered his illicit sweetheart. If there is anything in this story, it might account for the figure appearing most frequently to another rector. It is interesting to note that the whole area once formed part of an estate belonging to the powerful Waldegrave family. This included the church, the third to be erected on the site, and a shooting range, the manor house, a former rectory, and several other houses and cottages, all of which have been the scene of alleged psychic disturbances. I spent many hours with Mr. Merriweather during a period extending over 12 years, both at his home on the Mercy Island and in the vicinity of Langenhoe Church. I found him ready and willing to discuss the curious happenings that he'd witnessed, open to questioning and always eager to obtain corroboration or an explanation for the strange occurrences. I believe he was genuinely puzzled by the things that had happened to him, and if some of them were hallucinations or unconscious mind phenomena, it was only in this single sphere that he experienced these manifestations. Away from Langenhoe, his life was undisturbed by any psychic sense, and he led the quiet and satisfying existence of a country clergyman. Mr Merriweather retired from the ministry in 1959, and the living of Langenhoe was combined with that of a neighbouring parish. Haunted Langenhoe Church, a desolate and silent sentinel, stood for some years alone with its ghosts until it fell into decay and was finally pulled down. On one of my last visits to Mr Merriweather, he presented me with his private notes on the case and a relic from the Langenhoe Church, the beautiful little credence bell. I hope that it will ring for me one day without a human agency. I didn't realise that story was so long when I started it, to be honest. So hopefully those stories have made you suitably comfortable and relaxed, if a little spooked. And uh, thank you for watching. Sweet dreams. Goodbye.